so I am an archaeologist. I dig square holes in the ground because circular ones just won't do. They have to be square. Um, and I look for artifacts and bones that tell a story of a time long gone. I am also a biological anthropologist, so I'm very interested in human bones. The 206 bones that you carry around with you all the time are a perfect record of your life, telling the story of your life when you can no longer do so. Your bones have so much power. They tell me your sex, the age of you were when you died. They give me a glimpse into your life history, telling me about your health status and any injuries that you might have sustained during life. And if I read the bones a little bit more, taking into consideration the position in which the bones were found in and the location of where they were found, I can tell behavioral um, instances in, in those cases, determining how you died, how you landed up where you were, and what this says about the society that placed you there. But this is not a story about that. This is a story about journey and discovery. Because you see, I'm also an explorer. I'm an explorer by nature and by title as well. And I just want to tell you a story about discovery. And so I, I burst into the paleoanthropology scene about four years ago. And the one place where you can find the largest concentration of fossil remains that tell the story of our deep human journey is the Cradle of Humankind. And that is located 45 minutes away from where we're seated right now. At the Cradle of Humankind is home to the largest concentration of fossil remains that tell the story of our deep human journey as well as animals via 15 key fossil sites that were found in the area. And one of these sites is Gladys Vale. And Gladys Vale is my, my little baby. Um, I just entertain me for a minute here. I want you to close your eyes and to transport yourself to the Cradle of Humankind. Now, I want you to build yourself or imagine yourself um, a cave system that is comprised of two large chambers and several smaller ones. Now place that cave in a picturesque valley surrounded by lush vegetation and then place a stream that lies not too far away from the site. So that is your physical landscape of Gladysville. Then I want you to introduce some common animals that will come say hello to you when you were working at Gladysville. This would be your giraffe, wildebeest, and warthogs. And of course, you can't forget the resident baboons that hang out in the hill across the road, and they're screaming and shouting at you because you're now hanging out in their favorite spot, and you're eating your lunch, and you're not sharing with them. But you know what? They get over it eventually. They do. But why Gladysville? Why am I interested in Gladysville? Gladysville is home to an arc of fossils that tell the story um, of the landscape. Many, many faunal remains have been found at Glasgow. Fossils such as bovids, so these are your antelopes, um, equids, your ancient zebras, um, and there's even an African wolf, the remains of an African wolf, and a giant hyena. These are very special animals. And it's not just animal remains were found at Gladysville, but in 1991, 47 years after the last discovery of an ancient human ancestor, Australopithecus africanus, or as some as you know as Mrs. Pless, was discovered at Stokefontein. 47 years later, at Gladysville, 1991, two hominin teeth were discovered. Again, I have to point this out, this is 47 years afterwards, right? And it was the discovery of these two teeth that would then attract more attention back to Gladysville. And for 17 years, Gladysville was an active research site again. And many more discoveries were made at this point. Discoveries that would that include um, the specialization of dating techniques that were specific to Southern Africa. Those techniques were developed at Gladysville. A hyena latrine was discovered at Gladysville, and in that latrine was some coprolites, and coprolites essentially are fossilized poo. I mean, who would look at fossilized poo? But somebody did, somebody chopped open a fossilized poo, and within that, they found hominin hair, dating back to 195 to 250,000 years ago. Hair in poo. That is incredible stuff. And so, like I said, I, I burst onto the paleoanthropology scene four years ago, and then a year ago, I became the principal investigator for Gladysville the first time a black woman has ever held this title in South Africa. 
And so I would go ahead and lead an expedition team to go back to Glasgow to A, make new discoveries because everybody that joins this field wants to make a discovery. And we wanted to do that too. But also we were gonna take on a very daunting task. We were gonna to try to provide context to material that was out of context. So give meaning to the meaningless. And we were planning to do this by going back to Glasgow, physically picking up every single pile of breccia, every block of breccia, and that's the material in which the fossils are encased. In. We pick up every single one, check to see if there are any fossils that might have been missed, and then place those blocks, whether they had fossils or no fossils in them, and create an outline or reconstruct the cave on the surface. We would recreate the outline of the cave and other small features within it. And the reason why we did this is because when you see it in the light, if you see the cave system in the light, we can then start understanding the pathways in which miners moved through these cave systems. And using geology magic, we would then place these pressure blocks back into time and space and understand how all these fossils actually interact with one another. So that was a plan. Uh, it was a good plan. We were pretty excited for it. And then I received a comment that no early career researcher wants to hear. And it went along the lines of, oh, so in 2022, we're still trying to do things like that. You know, going back to old sites, asking the same old questions, trying to make new discoveries. Haven't we discovered everything that there is to discover about our human origins? Like, what's the point of what you're doing? What's the point? And I was just like, Okay, my dude, all right, thanks for the vote of confidence. It's amazing. But anyway, that's not a story about that, really. So we go back to Glasgow, and we, we start the first expedition, um, and here we, we're targeting what I call the historic dumps, the dumps that I know that previous researchers had handled and moved around the site. These are the dumps that are out of context. And so for five weeks, we worked through about 12 dumps. And um, what did we find? Well, every second block that we picked up had a fossil in it, every second block. It's like, what did previous researchers for 17 years, what were they doing if every second block has a fossil in it? But it's true, every second block had a fossil in it. Um, and annoyingly, all the fossils that we were finding were already common to the Gladys Vale assemblage. So we weren't really adding any new information here. But I did comfort myself in knowing that we had established a good operational system and a good team, good solid team, and we were operating like a well-oiled machine. And so we will go off for a month, month's break, and then return to Glasgow for part two. And part two of the Glasgow expedition, uh, we were then gonna focus on the underground dump, right? The dump that is almost untouched, sitting in the lower cave or the lower chamber of the upper cave. And we were very confident about this dump. We were very confident that we were gonna find something here. We were gonna find that thing because it's almost untouched. And the only time it was ever worked on was in 1991 when those two hominin teeth were discovered at Gladysville. There are 206 bones in the human body, 32 teeth in your mouth. Only two teeth survive, really? I was not buying that, I was not buying that. So that's why we talked to this place and we were so confident that we we're gonna make a discovery. Two weeks into the expedition and we found Dololo, <laughs> nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing. And I, I will be very honest with you at this point, I was gutful. I was beyond frustrated because I'd been living in a tent for almost two months at this point. In a tent, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of winter, in the wilderness with some wild animals. Like, I just wanted to go home. I was, I was over it. Until one day, something happened. Um, so I'm working on site and the team is working underground, very hard at work, and I'm being interviewed at this moment. And then one of my colleagues rushes up to us. Um, and he's like, I'm so sorry to disturb your interview, so sorry, but doctor, we need you to come now. And I'm looking at this guy and he's got this very serious facial expression. And I'm just like, oh God, somebody got injured underground and I'm probably gonna have to call for a helicopter rescue or something. I don't remember the number. I can barely remember my own cell phone number. 
And so I'm being rushed off to the science tent. And clearly I'm not moving fast enough because this guy is really pushing me. He's making me move. So eventually I make it up the hill to the science tent and they're like, you need to sit down. And usually when people tell you to sit down, it's not good news. So again, I'm just like, oh God, somebody got injured. Maybe somebody died. Okay. And then as I'm sitting down there, I hear a sound, a bustling sound coming from behind me. And I look over my shoulder and there's the rest of the underground team. They're coming up and they're all coming towards me. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Okay, 911. 03, 911, is that, is that correct? Okay. So I'm sitting there trying to look cool, trying to play cool. Um, and then they place a block in front of me. And, um, you know, instead of telling you the story, I, I, I think I want to show it to you via some short clips that we took. Um, these clips have never been seen before, so please do enjoy them. <laughs> Shit. Oh my god. Oh my god, you guys. It's a face. Yeah. It's a face. 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 It's a I told her yesterday, I said, relax. Oh man. This is good, yeah, I know. This is something. Where's the rest of it? I will find it more. Yeah. We'll see where uh, we start looking where we find this one. Uh, when we started now. Only started now. At lunchtime. Yeah. I, I don't even want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's go, let's go. <sighs> wow. This is fight? so exciting. And so that day, the 12th of July 2022, was known as Holy Shit Day. Because we could not stop saying holy shit. I, I was on the phone with my mentor and I told him what we found and he was also like, shit. Holy shit! Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm sure now you're wanting to know what did we find? <sighs> I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what we have found on that day. And, you know, that's, that's a second phase of the journey of discovery. Um, we just found it. Now the fossil needs to be prepared and then analyzed and then revealed as to what it is. But I want to take it back to the comment that was made um, to me. And that is, what's the point in what you're doing? You're wasting your time. What the Gladysville Expedition Team has managed to do, and I'm very proud of them for this, is that they have shown the value in going back to old sites and asking new questions. But doing this, by taking this new approach, asking new questions, pushing the limits both physically and mentally, you're able to make great discoveries. And if for as long as there are people around asking questions, exploration isn't dead. And once we accept that, new and exciting things will come to light that will add not only to the story of Gladys Bell, perhaps to the story of the cradle of humankind. And dare I dream it to say, add to the story of our deep human journey. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a great audience and I finally get to say these words to you. Thank you for coming to my TEDx talk. <laughs>